Today is November the 28th, 2022. My guest is Gidon Novik, who is a socially minded entrepreneur focusing on innovative and high impact businesses. More specifically, Gidon, we love to talk about airlines in South Africa, which is your playground. Good to see you again. You too, Addison. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the flesh. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we do have good lunches. Um, so obviously, um, in our catch-up chat here, um, what is going on in South Africa? I heard an, a crazy thing this morning. Someone said to me that ESCOM was going to shut down for two weeks so that they could do maintenance, that the country would have no power for two weeks. The stuff coming out there, coming out from there is, shall we say, a little crazy. Well, we're still going. I mean, <laughs> we've, we've had our challenges. But, you know, we're quite a resilient bunch, as you know. Um, there's a big event in a few weeks' time with the ANC elective conference. So we're all watching that closely. Um, not necessarily hoping for miracles, but, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's a lot at stake. So, and, and as you know, we are, you know, we're an economy that's gone nowhere in pretty much a decade. And uh, got a lot of frustrated people. So... You know, we've uh, the the frustrating part is that we just have so much potential. You know, in our world, just looking at the travel and tourism sector, and the potential this place has to be just a outstanding tourism destination. You know, attracting you know tens of millions of uh, wealthy people from from the north. Uh, it, that that potential exists, and it's frustrating that it's taking us so long to get there. But we, um, yeah, we keep going. We're an optimistic bunch as well. Well, that's 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 good. I mean, that's I remember being living there when I was a kid. So of yeah. course, the you're entering tourist season now. Um, you've got living. You live in Cape Town, so you've you're seeing obviously United and Delta now flying there. Um, the yeah, Europeans are coming back. That Cape Town is hot this time of the year. Temperature wise, yeah. traffic wise, tourism. Yeah. So an interesting stat, Edison, um, before COVID, there were about 120 inbound flights into Cape Town a week. Um, we're now from sitting at a, or is that domestic? From, uh, sorry, um, yeah, international. Dine okay. Domestic, obviously, a lot more. International flights. And we're now sitting at about 190, so significantly more inbound international flights than pre-COVID wow. into Cape Town. So that's that's very positive. There's a, there's a group called Westgrow who... Spend a lot of their efforts promoting um, international carriers coming directly into Cape Town, and they've done a phenomenal job. So, so it's quite a it's, it's, it's quite a good sense in Cape Town um, around tourism and travel, and uh, we're hoping you know it's not just a blip and a kind of revenge travel phenomenon, and that people you know really start coming here consistently. Right. Well, I mean, the rand is so cheap for anybody tra yeah. traveling in euros or dollars. It's um, it is a the bargain. Of the, the it's very far to get there, but once you're there, oh, the flora, oh, the fauna, the people, the food, the the, the drink. That's worth bar it. Bargain price is incredible. Anyway, so let's let's move back to the airline industry for a minute. Obviously, the yeah. big, the, the, the the big uh, the big Kahuna there is SAA. Do you think SAA is still getting state support, or are they been have they been weaned off now? No, it's still state funded. It's still one hundred percent owned by the state. The um, they call it the SEP deal, the Strategic Equity Partner, of which we're we're a part of the consortium. Um, I resigned as a director of the consortium in the last ten days or so. I was just struggling to get information and any kind of you know insight as to what what was actually going on, and felt quite uncomfortable being on the board. But we remain as minority shareholders in the consortium. And that consortium was, uh, you know, supposed to conclude a deal to take a 51% share in SAA. Um, that deal hasn't concluded. It's about 18 months since it was uh, initiated. And, you know, we wait and see whether it's, uh, you know, whether it progresses, whether the funds have been raised. And uh, and whether it can actually conclude. So as of uh, you know, as of now, SAA is operating. It's pretty small. Um, it just has has a, operating a few aircraft, um, domestic and some regional routes. Um, a tiny speck of you know what it once was in terms of size and stature, I guess. 
so it, it, it really is uh, literally up in the air in terms of how that story unfolds. Right. South African Airways used to obviously when the, the in its former glory days had access to almost any part of the world. What do you think is going to happen to all that access, those market access? Are there other airlines in the South Africa who obviously are, you don't want to just stay inside the pressure cooker, you want to get beyond the border? Sure, sure. Well, things obviously haven't stood still. Um, and I would imagine this has happened globally, you know, with the um, COVID effect on so many carriers. Um, other carriers have, uh, have filled the gap to a large extent. So, I mean, if you look internationally, I was just sharing some stats on, on Cape Town. So, you know, those international carriers have stepped in in a big way. And um, we actually are very well served from an international global point of view in South Africa. We have incredible, you know, service from the world's best airlines. So that's kind of on a long haul basis. On a regional basis, you know, there's some very strong regional players like Ethiopia and that, you know, service South Africa very extensively. Um, Airlink has filled a lot of the gaps in terms of um, some, some of the regional routes with the smaller equipment. So things have not stood still um, by any means. And uh, as you say, you know, we sit on the southern tip of Africa. So if you're an airline business and you want to grow, you have to look north. Otherwise, you know, you are going to hit a point of, um, of uh, maturity or saturation pretty, pretty, pretty quickly. So one has to look north. We have a very robust domestic market, although I think the signs there are a little bit of uh, irrational exuberance and, you know, uh, potentially overcapacity, which kind of always is the cycle that we subject ourselves to. And so, so that's, I think that's the risk uh, uh, from a domestic point of view. But, uh, but the region is opening up and that is, you know, still the big opportunity possibly globally, you know, this is still the untapped continent uh, in terms of travel right. and in terms of economic growth. And um, our resources on the continent are in global demand now. So we potentially have, have a, a strong bull run in terms of the, the desirability of Africa as a, as a continent. Um, so, yeah, it will be an interesting decade or two, I think, in terms of the evolution of African aviation and obviously sorry I'm talking a lot the uh, regulation is 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 still the key it still is highly regulated there are signs of liberalization in certain markets and um, there's a lot of talk around opening you know opening it up but as you know that talk's been going for 20 years now right so what, what could be interesting is you know with so many failed state carriers and you know almost less that governments have to protect uh, that could be the catalyst for saying, you know, let's just open this thing up and let's uh, let's let the most efficient players come in and serve our local markets. Right. I mean, if you look if you look at the the, the operation of an airline, the number one thing is to drive for low, lowest possible costs. And I think for an African uh, airline system, as we've been following it, it's government intervention has only ever added to costs. When you hear people say that the quickest way between some some countries in Africa is to go through Brussels, that's insane. But yeah. it's real, you know. Absolutely. So it's it's a crazy thing. Um, your your airline Lyft has a unusual, perhaps unique business model. Is that working the way you you planned it? Do you have to modify it, or do you think it's it's going to be just fine? No, it's working. Um, you know, the model is. As you say, you know, make sure we have a very low unit production cost, which we do. Um, that model will have to evolve over time as we renew the fleet and, and probably will keep driving the unit cost down as we get newer and newer equipment. So, um, and, 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 you know, when you're able to start afresh, you know, you know this very well. Um, and, you know, leapfrog, not only on the technology side, but just in terms of processes and and thinking, you really have a massive advantage over over legacy, and uh, and that's really what at the heart of Lyft and the culture and Jonathan who runs it, who came out of Uber and just it's just the way that he thinks, it's the way that he approaches the world. Everything is around efficiency. Everything is is around how we can use technology to be not only more efficient but serve our customers better. So the model's working well. You, you, you know, people ask, are we a low cost airline? Well. 
you know, our cost base is very low. So does that make us a low cost airline? Maybe, but you know, in terms of how it's presented to the customer, it's it's a it's a it's a premium experience. What do we, what do I mean by that? It, it's an elevated experience. Our crew are completely engaged. They are um, service oriented. They enjoy their they enjoy their work. It comes through on the uh, customer experience. We serve a refreshment on board, which you know is a small thing, but that branded cup of coffee, which we do in partnership with a coffee brand called Vida E, it just makes a big difference, even though it's just a cup of coffee or a glass of wine in the afternoon. So, so, so it is working, you know, not to say we can't do things better. The guys are always looking, thinking, try, trying new things, but, uh, but it is working really well. That's great. I mean, good news, good news is always good news, right? You mentioned something about updating the fleet. That obviously is something that I, um, at Air Insight, we are, we love that stuff. <laughs> we love that stuff. When you look around, because Neos and Maxes, I guess that's the ideal, and even probably the 220, it's hard to get them. Yeah. Because there's such a demand worldwide. If all the airlines want to go green as possible. The, green, the quickest way to green is the newest possible engines which come on the newest airplanes. Um, the yeah. only the only airplane you could probably get a delivery on real quick is somebody else's Max who's not taking it, or an E2. Um, yeah. When you look across the spectrum, what, can you share some thoughts with us on 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 the thinking with at, at Lyft? Yeah, I think you, you know the economics are are plain to see. You know the new aircraft work. I mean, the one thing one has to be mindful of is obviously utilization. So uh, going back to the you know assessment of the South African situation, geographically our domestic market doesn't drive great utilization because we only fly really between you know 6 a.m. and let's say 10 p.m. So it's hard to get more than you know eight or ten hours if you're lucky per day out of an aircraft on the domestic route. So so the it, it is really important to get the regionals into the mix. Um, to make those new aircraft really work. Um, and then obviously, you know, access to these aircraft and not only access to the aircraft, but access to the aircraft at the right price. That's really the, the challenge. And um, I think that's where, in my opinion, that's where Kome got unstuck is, you know, they got quite enamored by this idea of new aircraft and on a spreadsheet, it looked really good. But, you know, did us, you know, can a small airline like that actually get a, decent deal out of a manufacturer i don't believe on their own they can and um you know and 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 obviously the debt that comes with that is very onerous when when things turn so it's it's a dilemma um it's it, it is an inevitability i think you know if one you know charts the path of a of a long-term airline which we certainly hope to be um new aircraft will feature into that at some point the question is when when is the right time right you know, it's interesting. I, I do a chat like this with some people in India once a month. Um, and in India, they have the same problem where you've got obviously local currency, but your big asset comes in with dollars. Your fuel yeah. comes in dollars. And so the currency risk is enormous. And what they've done in India is they have developed a buffer, so to speak. They have a financial um vehicle that takes in the asset in dollars and locks that and then offsets the local current the local users they have a essentially a leasing vehicle that they've created to protect people from the vicissitudes of of currency fluctuation because that can drive you crazy it's like the cost of oil you have yeah. no control over that yeah if the cost of oil is, is spiking and not spike or you know doing all kinds of things that's one problem, but when it spikes in dollars, that's even you know it's a, it's a double whammy. So there's there's something that you might look at there. No, that's um, really interesting. That, yeah, that really um, interesting. Yeah. So so the, when we've spoken before, you've made a very interesting point that really, given the 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 situation in South Africa, you the, the way you foresee it is that really the most effective thing to do is not to get state-of-the-art airplanes because it's just too expensive given the margins and how competitive the local market is yeah i, I think one has to keep um keep an open mind 
Addison, because I think, um, I mean, you know the market better than anybody. One has to be opportunistic as well. You know, these opportunities do come around for whatever reason, you know, maybe there's a, um, a, a, a fleet available and, and one needs to um, act quickly to, um, you know, to, um, to get involved. So, so I think one has to, and, and, you know, we're, we're a new airline, you know, we, we small, we've, we've got five soon to be six aircraft. So if we are going to, you know, look at, re, look at a, a different fleet strategy, um, you, you know, it is, it is a time, particularly if we're going to change fleet, you know, if we were to, for example, go into a Boeing fleet, um, you know, from our current Airbus fleet, now probably would be the right time before we get too big and then it becomes almost impossible to make that transition. Right. So we've got a completely open mind and, you know, we're looking at probably too many options because you know, it's, um, we're big on options, particularly because we knew and, you know, we talked to lots of people, but, you know, at some point we're going to have to uh, make a call. Right. And, um, you know, a lot, a, a lot of it's also driven by a view on, uh, on, on fuel, you know, what is, what, what does that look like? You know, fuel comes tumbling down. Uh, the new aircraft are still attractive, but less attractive. Um, so, so, so we we're looking at it all the time, and you know we're not there yet in terms of figuring we, out. Long-term. You know, when you look when you looking as you look at um, fleet, are you looking at 150 yeah. to 160 seaters? Are you looking at lower than 150 seats? Is there? No. A... Uh, so, so, so the main focus is the bigger aircraft. We we put out a um, a statement a few weeks ago. Um, around the secondary routes, which would obviously require smaller aircraft. It's not our priority right now, but it's something that, uh, you know, we, we need to be mindful of because we're in a relatively small market. We will either have a situation where all the major players do both. In other words, you know, fly the large narrow bodies and, you know, the regional jets, Embraer's um, E-190s or 195s. Or a situation where you have specialist carriers that you know operate the bigger narrow bodies and specialist carriers that operate the smaller narrow um, narrow bodies that cooperate with each other. So, so those are the two scenarios. It, you know, we we may have to you know get serious about the um, regional regional jets if you know if we find the market saturated on the uh, on, on the trunk routes. But our our specialty at the moment is higher volume. You know the the one eight nine seaters in you know all economy. We have a two class configuration, where you know our seating config gets us to closer to one hundred and seventy seats, and that's really where we you know we focused at the moment. Right, and two two items that um, are you look would lift look to fly beyond the border. I mean, like Luanda, Zambia. Yeah, if if you're going to grow in this region, you you have to. You you can't you can't you stand. Look, so you are looking at that. Yeah, and we, and we're looking at that again. It's you know we've got a view. We um and we we never want to be arrogant about it, but the the, the current model works well. Um, we 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 need to grow it. We need to grow it either ourselves or through collaboration with with other players. Um, you know, airline the right airline collaborations, I think, make a lot of sense. Um, you know save you know significant uh, capital risk if you're able to do the right. the right coaches and alliances and even mergers you know we you know we we kind of early on in the discussions on the SAA deal you know we we did discuss the idea <clears throat> you know what if you took a really efficient um platform that Lyft has and combine that with an SAA kind of platform which is carries a much bigger overhead but has you know the reach into Africa has the route rights, has the brand presence, has some of the infrastructure required. That, that you know that that made a lot of sense and may still make a lot of sense. So, you know, I'm all for looking for collaboration opportunities, but if they don't work, then we got to figure out how we're going right. to do it ourselves. Last item I was going to ask you about is freight. How big is that in your world, or even in your future? What was that? Freight. Oh, freight. Sorry, I didn't Cargo. hear you properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, it's way too small right now. Um, we we uh, we need to spend a lot more time on it. Um, it's it is the big opportunity, and particularly as we look further north, you know, that's uh, 
that's a massive opportunity. Domestic freight, you know, it's a it's a nice add-on. I don't necessarily think it's a it's a business line we want to focus on on the, on the domestics, but certainly moving around the continent, it's a, it's a big piece. And and by the way, I think you know the big opportunity, the initial opportunity is to do is, is to do both. In other words, have a big focus on uh, belly freight alongside the, um, the the passenger operations. And coming back to your point on the on the on the aircraft, and again, this is your expertise. But you know these newer aircraft have incredible performance. Um, you know, with uh, you know full loads of passengers and freight, and you know something that we you know can't necessarily do with the current equipment. So that's also really interesting to us. Right. I remember doing a conversation, having a conversation um, with I think it was Comair at the time. Yeah. And we were talking about the fact that with the, when the Max came to the and they only took, they only got one, but when that Max arrived, they could go from Johannesburg to uh, to Nigeria. They could do Lagos. Absolutely. And then they could do one stop Lagos to London. You know, on a max. Uh, we yeah. see, for example, in the States, um, we in I live in Baltimore. Yeah. Iceland Air is flying here with a max every day. Yeah. And the competitors play with the 321 Neo. But yeah. the Max and as a these new airplanes, like you say, the performance is incredible, particularly in range. You can do all kinds of interesting things. And I think for for the situation that you face, where you're in this horrible bubble, but it's very competitive, and you've got it's a nice bubble. Don't it's knock a very bubble. pretty bubble. It's a very pretty bubble, but it's a it's still a bubble. And you want to be able to go Luanda. You want to be able to go where the action is. And if you can do freight and you can do overnighting and you can get more hours, yeah. that that I think really does some interesting stuff to your spreadsheets. Absolutely, absolutely. That, 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 that you're spot on. Um, long haul, you know, with a narrow body. I mean, when I say long haul, our long haul is, you know, 11, 11 hours or there or thereabouts. I'm not, I'm not convinced that uh, passengers will be happy to sit in a narrow body for that long. Um, not at 170 seats on a 320. No, that would not yeah. be optimal. Especially, you know, given that they have so many alternatives currently. You have to so. have more than one cup of coffee or one more, one more, more, more than one cup of wine. For sure. For sure. Gidon, lovely to talk with you. Thank you so much. And you're looking forward to seeing you. Thank you.